Well, to discuss all of this, we welcome to our set David Smolansky. He is a founding member of the Venezuelan Voluntad Popular political party. From Windsor in Canada, Joe Emmersberger is a writer and political analyst. Also with us, Fernando Kurtz is the former director for South America at the White House National Security Council. And from Caracas, Lucas Kerner is a political analyst and editor for VenezuelaAnalysis.com. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Lucas, let me start in Caracas. And uh, as we've seen today, there were rival demonstrations, people backing the interim president, or the man claiming to be the interim president, uh, Juan Guaido, and those backing President Maduro. Uh, sitting there in Caracas day to day, what is life like? Do you get a sense that this is coming to a head, or is life going on as normal? Life largely continues as normal in Caracas. People go about their daily lives. All the shops are open. You know, Juan Guaido, as, as your reporter mentioned, is largely a virtual presence with no real impact on country. I was actually at the opposition march today, and it's notable that the participation seems to be lagging in comparison to last Saturday, excuse me, two Saturdays ago march, and then which also was smaller in comparison to the January 23rd march where Juan Guaido swore himself in. There seems to be a feeling of you know, discouragement, disorientation, and demobilization around among opposition supporters whom we, talk, we spoke to because they have no sense of when Mr. Guaido is actually going to occupy Miraflores' presidential palace. We're three, we're three weeks into this, and it's not clear how Mr. Guaido will oust the president, given he doesn't appear to have domestic forces to do so, and is more, just repeating further calls on the military to oust the president, and at the same time calling for foreign military intervention, or not at least not ruling it out. So I think it's a very dangerous situation that we're in that, you know, it appears that Washington and its allies are trying to oppose a president uh, as the U.S. has explicitly threatened through force. And, you know, this is, you know, without any being right. any closer to that person actually being in charge of the country. David, where do you see this going? Is Juan Guaido, as Lucas tells us, losing some, or the, is the movement losing some of its uh, momentum right now? Uh, totally not. I mean, it's uh, all the opposite. I mean, this uh, movement is getting stronger and stronger. Uh, first of all, the transition in Venezuela has begun. This is no way back. Uh, Guaido has been able to unite what in the past was the opposition, now is the interim government. Uh, second, he has united the people, and the people have, have come to the streets again on non-violent protests. Um, third, he's got uh, the recognition of more than 60 countries all over the world. This is not only the U.S., Latin America, or even Europe. You're having Morocco, you're having uh, Micronesia, you're having uh, Israel, Australia. And also, he's having the legitimacy of the parliament, which I have to, I want mm -hmm. to stop here. Mm -hmm. Maduro created an illegal parliament in Venezuela in 2017. The legal parliament, which is an institution that is, that is run by the interim government, was elected by a vast majority in 2015. And the Venezuelan constitution says that when there is a vacancy of power, that's what we are having now in, in, in my country, right. because Maduro made a fraud last year, he was not re-elected, the head of the parliament, the speaker of the house, becomes the head of state. And that is what, what Guaido is, is, is doing. So I think Maduro is against his roads, and, uh, and I think we'll see uh, the fall of a dictatorship soon. Joe Emmersberg, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, a lot of controversy over the legitimacy of Juan Guaido uh, claiming to be the interim leader. He invoked that particular part of the Venezuelan <laughs> constitution, uh, which says that if the president, in this case Maduro, abandoned his post, then uh, he becomes the president. But there is also a part of the Constitution that says, and something that has been invoked before, that when the president can't do his job, then it's the vice president who takes over. What is, what is going on? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, Juan Guaido is, is, is only able to uh, exert any kind of, uh, have any impact at all, because he's backed by, by basically the world's biggest gangster state, the United States. I mean, uh, without that, I mean, it, this this re really goes nowhere, and he's leveraging that that threat. And this is actually the you have to remember this is really the sixth time now in, in you know nearly 20 years that the Venezuelan opposition has attempted to seize power by force. Uh, so that's something that's something very important to consider. And and four of those times uh, came before there was anything that could be called an economic crisis. I mean, they briefly deposed Chavez in 2002. Uh, installed a dictatorship that annulled the constitution that they're now trying to cite as, as something they believe in. And then uh, several months later, there was a sabotage of the oil industry. Then after Maduro's first election in 2013, there were violent protests trying to try to reverse the election. Then in 2014, there were, after they suffered uh, 
big defeat in municipal elections. They, again, took to the streets trying to force the government out. Uh, and then in 2017, again. So uh, this is the sixth now. This is the sixth time. So uh, the government, uh, Maduro's government's definitely made mistakes, huge mistakes. I, and, and I would say he's primarily responsible for the, the fact that the, the economy has, has got to the point where Trump can, can basically put his foot now on the throat of the Venezuelan economy. But that didn't start with the recognition of Guaido. That started in August of 2017, when the Trump really escalated the sanctions that, that Obama put in place that were doing damage, but it was very hard to quantify. But uh, he's already, uh, Trump's sanctions cost uh, Venezuela by now well over $6 billion, the financial sanctions right. he started in 2017. Now he's uh, drastically uh, escalated. And Francisco Rodriguez, as soon as, as uh, who's a, a Venezuelan economist who hates Maduro's government, by the way, and he, Joe, he immediately, yeah, he immediately yeah. changed his projection from from a contraction of 11 percent to All a right. contraction Joe, of 26 percent. Right, Joe. Let me ask you this. You know, you point out that uh, Nicolas Maduro has been largely responsible for what has happened to the economy in Venezuela right now, for its slide downwards. Uh, we know that three million people have left the country. We know that there's hyperinflation, the shortages of food, of medicines. Shouldn't he make way for someone else? Well, you know, first of all, there's two things people have to separate. One is the fact that there's an economic crisis, and the other fact is the government legitimate. Those are two separate things. You don't call the United States a dictatorship during the Great Depression or during the financial crisis. Those are separate issues, okay? But they, they tend to get conflated. Right. Now, and also, I mean, in, in, like I said, the United States has, has deliberately made the economic crisis far worse. Okay, and that that is, I mean, they, they will they don't have to worry about it. I mean, the fact that I mean, right now you yeah. basically have two, two career criminals, uh, John Bolton and Elliot Abrams, who are leading the charge to uh, to change uh, to overthrow Venezuela's government. So obviously they're not worried about you know, legal repercussions or even uh, apparently even reputational repercussions because they're still able to 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 get jobs in the U.S. government. Yeah, but that's that's something very important to consider. They're deliberately okay. making this. Fernando, uh, the fact that people like John Bolton, like Elliot Abrahams, President Trump, the fact that people like that are involved in what is going on in Venezuela uh, right now, does that undercut you know, those people who want change in Venezuela? You know, I, I think what's really important when we debate the policy is yeah. that we separate the policy that the White House and, and the administration is currently yeah. implementing from the people that some pe might be controversial or that for, you know, some people might like, others might not. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the actual policy that's being implemented by this administration, and in the early days of this administration, the first year of this administration, I was yeah. in charge of that policy, yeah. uh, it's, it's a very bipartisan uh, uh, policy. In fact, uh, it's a continuation of the Obama administration's policies. Yeah. We just kind of ramped it up a bit, you know, but it was all designed while yeah. uh, the, President Obama was still in charge. So I, I take the point that President Trump is, is very uh, polar, uh, mm -hmm. right? Some people love him, some people hate him, uh, and I, that, that, that's not going to change on, on the Venezuela topic. Uh, but it, what I would strongly encourage folks to do is to judge the policy on its own merit. Okay. Uh, we're looking at the policies, but what mm -hmm. is the end game for the United States here? Well, I, I think the end game is to restore democracy in Venezuela. I, I think that... But is that uh, the job of the United States? Well, I think the United States, uh, you know, has always been very cautious and very involved around the world when it comes to democracy, when it comes to human rights. Uh, well, it, it hasn't know, been in Egypt or Saudi Arabia. Well, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to yeah. defend, uh, right. you know, U.S. policy mm -hmm. overall. But, but I will say, I think on Venezuela, we're doing the right thing. I think that uh, it's important for, uh, for, for the, the, the international community. Right. And, and by the way, it's not just the United States, right? As, as uh, David mentioned, it's, it's, the, it's the international community. The Latin American countries through the Lima Group have actually been leading on this effort. Right. And if you look at the statements that kind of really sparked a lot of what's been happening in the last couple of months, uh, it was really Latin America that showed the lead. The United States is kind of following behind. In 2017, if you want to go back a couple of years, it was the yeah. people of Venezuela who were taking the lead. The United States was kind of trying to catch up, and, and you know, we, were, we yeah. were running against the clock trying to see what we could do to help. But it's really been a, a, uh, the people versus a dictator. It's been the region versus a tyrant. And the United States has played a role, no doubt. But I would never say that uh, th this has been a U.S.-led effort. It's been a multinational effort. Let's go back to Lucas in Caracas. And Lucas, uh, I mean, where do you see this going? How is this going to be resolved? We heard uh, about just over a week ago, we heard President Nicolas Maduro talk about new elections. He's prepared to go into new elections. I mean, could that happen? I think that 
at, at this point, it doesn't seem like the opposition is a, at all willing to negotiate any kind of, uh, you know, peaceful or, you know, a, a pacted settlement that could really uh, bring us away from the brink of civil war or, you know, foreign military intervention with catastrophic consequences. I mean, Donald Trump has ruled out any kind of negotiation with the Maduro administration. Likewise, Guaido and is talking about authorizing U.S. military force. I mean, these sanctions are likewise are going to have a catastrophic consequence, cause Venezuela's economy to sink, to shrink by over a quarter just this year. The, you know, I mean, we, we saw the consequences of sanctions in Iraq in the 1990s. 500,000 children were died as a result of those sanctions. I mean, and Madeleine Albright at the time, who was a Democrat, said the price was worth it. Is the price worth it for a similar kind of humanitarian consequences in Venezuela? So I think we're in a really dangerous situation. And the, the, the sad part is that regional players, likewise, are, are playing a dangerous role. Regional players with very little democratic legitimacy, like Honduras, the so-called Lima group, is composed of countries with fragile legitimacy. Honduras, you had an election that was stolen in 2017. You know, Morales in Guatemala is likewise totally mired in corruption scandal, and neo-fascist Bolsonaro in Brazil. You know, Macri, who's implementing the most savage neoliberal austerity, who was, you know, basically by decree. I mean, these these are the democratic countries that are lining up, you know, against Venezuela. I mean, certainly, yes, and Maduro does have support of, of, country, of democracies like Norway and South Africa and others. So I think this clash of civilizations narrative is very faulty at best, and, you know, it's much more complex and nuanced, and I think there's really a desire upon, among the majority of Venezuelans to resolve this crisis, you know, through a peaceful means, a peaceful transition, you know, that involve without, you know, bloodshed, which is really what the hard-right faction of the opposition yep. led by Leo Polo Lopez and Juan Guaido and backed by Marco Rubio want to, to impose on Venezuela, to purge okay. the Chavistas, eliminate Chavismo as a political force. All right. David, uh, Lucas there speaks of a peaceful transition. Uh, would elections be the best way out? One of the guests we had here talking about Venezuela just uh, about a week ago said that actually having new elections right now would be a violation of the Constitution. Yeah, but if Lucas is in Caracas, he might know that uh, as we speak, more than 60 people have been killed by the brigades that was was created by Maduro, and its name is Faiz. Um, if he's in Caracas, he might know that there are more than 800 political prisoners, that in these 20 years, more than 300,000 people have been killed because of crime, making Venezuela one of the most violent countries in the world, and Caracas the most dangerous uh, capital to live in, 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 in the world. And, uh, and obviously, there are shortages of food and medicine that have created a humanitarian crisis with a consequence of 3 million people that have fled the country. So, I mean, the bloodshed here has been created by the regime. Uh, negotiations have been in the past. There was a negotiation in 2014. There was a negotiation in 2016 and 17. And what Maduro did, Maduro just used those negotiations and dialogue to uh, gain time, to stay in power, to put more people in prison, and to uh, demoralize uh, everyone. So uh, the only negotiation that we are proposing in Venezuela is the fall of the dictatorship to have unfree and fair elections, that Guaido has always said, to let the majority of the people elect their new uh, president. Uh, do you know that, for example, last year when we went to an uh, election, it was mm. no election, it was a fraud, the main political parties were illegalized, the main candidates were in jail or in exile, all the media has been controlled by, by the regime. So, so in Venezuela, we've been living under dictatorship for, for, for years. And, are there, and there is time to go to democracy. And which are the countries so that are supporting are Maduro's you, regime? So then Syria, I, yeah. Cuba, uh -huh. Nicaragua, or do, those are democracies? Okay, you say, you know, you uh, would, would be happy to get into negotiations, but would, that, would those negotiations start off with Nicolas Maduro immediately relinquishing all power, and then yeah. you have elections? Yeah. Then it won't be negotiations. What be Guaido, just... why, uh, President Guaido, what he has said is that uh, we need to build a transitional government right. and then right. have a free and fair elections. If Chavismo wants to compete there, welcome to compete. But we will have free and fair, not with the condition that we're having now. Right. Okay. Joe Emmersberger, I know you want to say something. Go ahead. Yeah. Quick point here. Yeah. Henry Falcone, according to data analysis, he ran in the election. He came in second in the election in May of 2018. According to data analysis, he was, at the time of the election, the most popular of the prominent opposition leaders at That's the time. And, and, and uh, by the way, Juan Guaido is not even on the list. That's not true. I'm not, even, I'm not on the radar, OK? So he runs in the election. Nobody's even trying. I'm everyone saying fraud, no, this and that. Nobody's even trying to pretend to say that Falcon won or that it was stolen from him, because they can't, OK? Yeah. He lost because the, the prominent opposition leaders encouraged abstention and even attacked Falcon, saying he was a traitor and even in a secret dealings with uh, with okay, Maduro, so you got that kind, of, that kind of thing going on. Obviously, you're going to lose. So Maduro, Maduro got roughly 30% of the electorate. 
that really is not out of line with what his popular support has been. Again, just using that, that analysis, the, the, the opposition aligned pollster, not because they sh we should treat them as gospel, but just because there's mm -hmm. relentless propaganda. You have to right. use opposition well, to just even be heard. Okay, okay. okay. Have, you, have, you seen, have you seen children in Venezuela dying because of hunger? Have you seen people being killed by the, by the security forces of the regime? Have you, have you, what, what's, one moment, I just want to know, time. so it's, it's, it's so comfortable to, to comment it. from Windsor, Canada, it's, okay. so, it's so comfortable. All right. It's, it's very comfortable. To yeah. Power. Okay, yes, sure. let me, Fernando, let me get to you. Uh, the United States believes that sanctions is going to be the way in which they could get Nicolas Maduro out of power. If that doesn't happen, what then? Well, I think that's a tough question. You know, I, I think uh, th what the United States is trying to do is to support the people of Venezuela, who, who as we've been saying, are, are out in the streets. You know, the region who's been grappling with the crisis, uh, not just internally in Venezuela, but that's increasingly external, right, as you see the mass migration pouring into Colombia, into Brazil, into Ecuador, into right. Peru. Uh, so so it's, it's a tough crisis now that's become really a regional and international crisis in many ways. Mm -hmm. if, if Maduro stays in power, if the status quo presumes somehow uh, which, which I think would be uh, incredibly unfortunate, especially for the people of Venezuela who are, who are the ones actually suffering down there, uh, then I think we're going to have a real serious challenge because the mass migration will only get worse, the economic crisis will only get worse, uh, and so there will have to be some, some way to address this. You know, you know, Colombia could be yeah, easily destabilized. The thing is, you say that the United States wants to help the people of Venezuela. As our reporter mm -hmm. pointed out at the beginning of the show, uh, previous sanctions were very targeted sanctions. They targeted Absolutely. individuals. The sanctions now being imposed are being imposed on the oil industry, and That's oil right. being the main source of income for Venezuela That's means right. that it's going to affect the entire population. It's True. going to be collective punishment. So how could the United States say it's out there to help the Venezuelan people? Right. So, so I think, you know, when, when we look, we're looking at this in 2017, we decided that we didn't want to do the oil sanctions because right. we were worried about the ramifications of it for the people. Uh, I think that the, the team now decided that it was the right time to do it because of the momentum on the ground, because of the will of the people. Essentially, the, the, the move, and you know, this is what I believe the White House yeah. is, is, is deciding, is that they want to pull the Band-Aid off, that instead of this slow suffering of the people, you need to get this change to happen quicker so that the people can actually start to recover. There's a huge hole that uh, Venezuela is currently in, and they're going to have to dig themselves out of that over a long period of time. We need to start that process sooner rather than later for the good of the people. All right, Lucas, talking about that huge hole that Venezuela is in right now, it's very dependent on oil. It has not diversified its economy. Almost 90% of its income comes from oil. Uh, we're hearing right now that current oil production is about 1.5 million uh, barrels a day. It could fall to below a million barrels a day once U.S. sanctions kick in. How is Venezuela going to meet that challenge? Well, Venezuela is already, I mean, we were just saying as of this uh, Monday, you're seeing that some of the tankers are already being rerouted to India and China, that there's already an effort to, you know, divert production to those markets. So it's not, it's obviously that's not going to be enough. I mean, this is going to be a massive blow to Venezuela's economy. And I think that this is not just a challenge. This, these sanctions are illegal. And not only that, this, the, the previous sanctions were not just targeted. They, the previous, as Joe mentioned, the, these $6 billion uh, it, in lost oil revenues were the consequence of the sanctions which were imposed by the Trump administration yeah. in August 2017. This decimated, you know, as Francisco Rodriguez has analyzed, this decimated Venezuela's oil industry. This is, you know, under international law, this is a violation of the Fort Geneva Convention, collective punishment. This is, I mean, the fact that you have this, this, this discourse about bringing democracy to Venezuela from, you know, someone like Elliot Abrams, who should be probably be in the Hague right now for the genocide in, in Guatemala in the 1980s, and also remember when he tried to, you know, send arms to the Nicaraguan uh, death squads, the Contras in the 1980s, with yeah. planes earmarked for humanitarian purposes, but he put weapons on them. Like, they're just trying, like, they're, now they're trying to claim the ship humanitarian aid to Venezuela. You know, the same people, it's the same story. But I mean, this, it's all about regime change. The United States has never cared about democracy because, as you mentioned, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Honduras, all of these countries. This is about, as John Bolton admitted, this is about getting the oil, okay. about opening up Venezuela's oil sector to these corporations. And it's about returning Venezuela to the pre-Chavez status quo, where elites like Mr. Smolansky ran the country and enriched themselves. David, That's what you it's about. respond to that? Well, um, uh, this guy unfortunately doesn't know where I come from. I mean, my family, my grandparents left the Soviet Union because of communism. My father left Cuba because of communism. And he was a democratic elected mayor. And then I was illegally removed by the regime. I am under arrest warrant. So um, uh, as I said at the beginning, a transition in Venezuela yeah. has begun. 
and, and Guaido, uh, President Guaido has three very powerful legitimacies. Mm -hmm. First of all, the support of the majority of Venezuelans. Millions of Venezuelans have gone to the street in the country and outside the country. Second, the legitimacy of the parliament, because everything that he has done is on, yeah. on our constitution. Mm -hmm. And third, a multinational effort. I mean, more than 60 nations all over the world are recognizing Guaido as the interim president, something unique in our region. Okay, Joe, uh, something that we haven't talked about and we've just got a couple of minutes left and that is the whole question mark over aid getting into Venezuela. We're hearing that the United States has sent aid or what it calls aid, uh, but it's being blocked from entering Venezuela. Uh, what, what happens next? Well, please remember, this is a big lie here. Nicolas Maduro uh, requested aid in November and received re emergency aid from the UN. So it doesn't matter what aid he requests. It doesn't matter if he wins the election and nobody can show that Falcon actually won it. This is not about democracy. It's not about any humanitarian crisis. They're trying to make the actual humanitarian crisis worse through the sanctions. I mean, they're offering $20, $20 million worth of aid when they're blocking billions of, of dollars of oil revenue from, from the country. It's a, it's a total joke. It should, it should not pass the laugh test. Again, as in Iraq, it's so appropriate that they have John Bolton spearheading this, because everybody should remember the coalition yeah. of the willing, yeah. the dozens of countries that went along with an invasion, <laughs> unprovoked invasion of Iraq based on a pack of lies, okay? You can always get so-called Western democracies to go along with uh, U.S. crimes. It, it happens, unfortunately, all the time. Canada was not officially, my country, not officially part of the coalition of the willing, yet still provided plenty of material support to that enterprise. So. It's, it's just bear that in mind when you hear all this about, you know, countries that recognize uh, what U.S. is doing in Venezuela. There's always countries okay. uh, willing okay. to go along. Fernando, very quickly, Venezuela is facing an economic crisis. We know that. But aren't the U.S. actions making things worse? Well, you know, I think, unfortunately, Maduro's actions are making things the worse. Yeah. And I think uh, the sooner that Maduro steps aside and allows his people to uh, restore democracy, the better that uh, the, the international community can come in and, uh, and start to, to take care of the people of Venezuela and allow them to, once again, restore the, uh, the, their rightful place as a upper-middle-class country in the world. Is Elliot Abrahams the right point man for this on the part of the United States? This guy's got yeah. a very shady history. I mean, he once <laughs> used aid... Uh, to send weapons into right-wing forces in Central America? You know, I, I think what, what, the, the more that we can avoid making this a partisan issue, the better. And yeah. I would encourage the White House and everybody, as they make policy decisions, as they make personnel decisions, right. to also make very, okay. very clear that this isn't and shouldn't be a partisan issue. You have Nancy Pelosi, you have Joe Biden making positive statements. Okay. And, and yeah. so we need to, I think, avoid that ad hominem stuff and really focus on the policy. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with Thank us. You. Thank you. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.